All right, you guys, we are getting into another week here. After going through plate tectonics and looking at earthquake correlation maps with plate tectonic boundaries and earthquake activity, we are going to get into the nitty gritty of earthquakes and their associated hazards. We briefly touched on faulting in the last lecture, and that is one side effect of uh, pl tectonic plate activity, specifically with convergent and transform boundaries. And faulting, or faults, are actually the primary source of most all earthquakes. This is because uh, during a fault we have these massive blocks of rock weighing several tons sliding past each other along some slope uh, because of some change or displacement in energy. And this can happen intentionally as well, so with divergent boundaries, if uh, plates are pulling apart, then a, the upper rock or the hanging wall will slide down against the foot wall as pictured in this example here in the bottom right corner. When this finally comes to a stop, it's going to have that impact that's a lot of force that's coming to an abrupt halt that's going to release a wave of energy, which we refer to as earthquakes. Now that point of collision or impact is referred to as the focus of the earthquake. So that direct point where that impact is occurring is actually below the surface. So that would be this uh, red mark right here. This is the focus of the earthquake where this energy uh, release is happening and it's being released in the form of waves and concentric circles uh, moving outward. And a lot of times when you hear about earthquakes in the news, they'll talk about the epicenter. And the epicenter is actually the point directly on the surface over the focus. So the focus is where that energy is actually coming from. The epicenter is that specific lat long, that location that we're referring to uh, when we talk about the epicenter of an earthquake occurring in whatever city uh, it may be causing X damage. When you guys looked at that map of all of the earthquakes occurring uh, by the USGS for your lab um, slash a little bit in lecture last week, what you're looking at is the epicenters of all of those earthquakes because you're looking at an aerial view map uh, of the world and you're seeing those lat long points of occurrences and then when you clicked on the points you could see the associated depth with those. That depth is the depth to the focus and that location that you're clicking on is the epicenter. Quick review of some of that vocabulary we learned last time on faults. The hanging wall is the, the wall along some uh, sloped separation or split in the rock that you would have to hang off of and the foot wall is the one that you could potentially put your feet on and walk up. We went over uh, several types of dip slip faults so those are the most common types normal, reverse, thrust. Um, you guys may not have ever seen these before it's not very common for us here in Michigan which makes sense because we don't have a whole lot of earthquake activity. Here at home we're more dealing with a lot of glacial sediment and sands clays, gravels, that sort of thing. If you go out in your backyard and start digging, it's going to be at least 60 feet or so in most places before you hit hard rock, and that's at the shallowest. But in many other places of the world, you can see examples of these types of faults, the dip-slip faults, normal, reverse, and thrust. Remember that normal is when the hanging wall moves downward. This picture here is an example of that. You can see that this arrow for the hanging wall is pointing in the downward direction. It's moving down slope. And then the foot wall is, move, is really staying stable, but in uh, relation to the hanging wall, it's moving upwards. These are just the arrows that geologists use to, to designate this movement. And you can see that slip plane, or that face of the rock that it's sliding against right here, where a bunch of the finer sediment has sort of uh, been smushed up into that frictional area. So normal, hanging wall moves down, reverse. Um, it's the opposite, hanging wall moves up. And then thrust is a type of reverse fault whose dip angle or the angle of the slope is less than 45 degrees. And this is how we categorize many of our fault types. Dip is the actual angle of that slope. We use this for faults, but we can also use this for other features, any feature in geology really, such as a 
dike or bedding or cross bedding, uh, anything that has some sort of angle relative to a horizontal surface parallel to the earth. The dip angle is the angle between whatever horizontal surface parallel to uh, the surface of the earth and the linear feature that you're seeing in the rocks. So this angle here is the dip. This would be probably about 45 degrees. And then we have strike, which refers to the orientation of the structure itself with respect to cardinal directions. To get a good idea of this, you have to remind yourself that this is not simply just a line that we're seeing. This is continuous through this whole section that's cut out. If we cut right down the center right here, we'd still see that same blue stripe and green stripe through the center. If we actually pull out that blue strip, it would look something like this, keeping that same orientation, of course, with a, a bit of a thickness to it. And so strike is if we were to lay our compass flat on that or a line oriented the same, notice this is parallel to the surface of that uh, feature. And uh, taking note that our compass is telling us that this is the east direction and this is the west direction, we can see that this feature is oriented with its strike uh, going east-west. Now, if we're just here to care about the general direction, then that's fine to say that it's striking in the east-west direction. However, most of the time we're looking for something specific. So um, with north being zero degrees up here, north zero degrees, east 90 degrees, south 180 degrees, and west being 270 degrees from north, this would be described as, as something slightly less than 270 degrees, maybe 260 two or whatever it is that our compass is showing. Now, back on this slide, you can see the dip angle of this fault very easily. We can, be, we can measure that fairly easily, no problem. Um, you can probably look at this and guess about what degree it is, somewhere close to 45. But you might have been thinking as you were looking at this, that, yeah, I see that, I see the dip angle, but I don't understand how you know which way these two blocks of rock are moving relative to one another. It, I don't see any clear indicators that uh, that hanging wall has moved down relative to the foot wall. They look like two different types of rock stuck next to each other. Maybe not so much here and here, but definitely here and here. And that's because this doesn't have a lot of what we call fault traces. This, on the other hand, would be a very good example of an obvious fault trace. This is a fence that was once installed completely in a straight line, and along this fault right here, break it. That rock is seen at the surface. Um, with You can measure that exact distance, so that would be the displacement. So this is where it originally was, and then a fault occurred. There was some movement along that fault. This would be a strike slip because they're moving parallel to one another. There's no uh, visible dip angle from this perspective. Or you can specifically see that movement that occurred via the fence. So that fence itself would be a fault trace. Now normally these aren't man-made features. These are uh, other things that we're looking at such as the difference in bedding themselves or other natural features such as drainages uh, like the example in this photo along the San Andreas Fault. You can see where this was once continuous and used to continue through here. These were once directly feeding into each other, and after a faulting occurred, you can see that separation of the rock there, and the movement of it, it moved in this direction, or in this direction, depending on how you're looking at it, and we now have that displacement, or offset, of this distance to this distance, because that's how far that feature moved. What you're seeing in both of those photos is really the aftermath of a fault. So sometimes it can occur where there's an immediate breakage, slippage, and a collision, um, but a lot of the times it's actually a, a slower process where through time uh, there will be some sort of movement in two very large blocks. So this is the movements maybe occurring uh, a quite a bit a distance away from where that difference in direction is meeting in terms of energy, and there's a slow directional uh, propagation where this section of rock from here to here is really building up a lot of tension and eventually it will reach its breaking point where it'll snap and that snap 
is what we call elastic rebound. So this is elastic energy that it's holding because it can stretch and be malleable to some degree, but as soon as it exceeds that degree, it's too much tension on it, it breaks, and then snapback releases energy as an earthquake as well. An elastic rebound is not exclusive to earthquakes. Elastic rebound can also occur when there's a large amount of weight uh, in the form of ice, glaciers, on top of land, and then as it melts, it releases some of that weight. It, it moves away in the form of water, and then that will see land sort of bounce back up now that it doesn't have that confining pressure of the glacier on top of it. This is something that is really common in Michigan, and we'll get into next lecture with Michigan geology, which is no longer actively happening as we don't have glaciers in Michigan, we haven't for a very long time, but we can see the after effect or features left behind from that process. That slow process of building that elastic energy uh, where it hasn't actually snapped yet, it's just building that tension, it's slowly moving further and further uh, in those opposite directions in the, the second timestamp of that last figure, but it hasn't yet broken, we call that fault creep. And so here's one urban example where you can actually see that happening. This is near the San Andreas and Hayward Faults in California. And so you can actually see, looking at this linear man-made feature, that over some amount of time since this was built, that this portion back here of the road is shifting in this direction, and this portion shifting in this direction relative to one another. So this, at some point, we're going to see a breakage right along this line. This from about here to here is that bending point, so it could break it anywhere in that, like, close to the middle of that portion. One of my favorite things about fault creep is that the USGS, the U.S. Geological Survey, has to keep uh, regular creep meters in place to, to monitor the movement, displacement of these uh, fault, fault creep processes to see when it will actually fault and release energy, um, although many of these are on a much smaller scale and aren't usually catastrophic, although if you, you're building directly on top of it, um, you can expect that that building at some point is going to have a shift in it and some, some damaging costs associated with that. Because of these USGS creep meters, we now know that the average rate of movement or displacement offset of those uh, fault creeps along this area of California near the San Andreas Fault is about 7.8 millimeters per year. That's about uh, 0.3 inches, a little less than the width of a pencil. Some other terms you may have heard before associated with earthquakes are foreshock and aftershock. Uh, the key in those terms being the fore and the after. It, it is the before the actual earthquake and after the actual earthquake. So these are earthquakes, but they're smaller earthquakes which either precede uh, the main event, so to speak, or come after the main event. So the foreshock is what tells us that there's going to be a major earthquake. A lot of times when we're monitoring for earthquakes, this is what we're looking for. And these are going to be small magnitude earthquakes occurring from smaller uh, faults surrounding where we're expecting to get uh, a much larger earthquake. So we'll see a number of these occur in a higher density uh, all around the proximity of where we can expect the earthquake. So here's a, a map here where we have a bunch of, in red, um, foreshock earthquakes. So you can see there's quite a range, but remember that these are this is due to a tectonic activity, so it's expected that you get something covering a wide area. So we might say anywhere from where we see the highest density, maybe here to here, we can expect a much larger earthquake depending on the magnitude and, and amount of time between these four shocks um, at you know some point in time in the future, sooner or later. And this is where the actual main event ended up occurring. So not directly in that density pocket, but um, definitely within range. Now, a number of these points in this figure are actually aftershock earthquakes as well. Um, and so after that main event occurs, the, the large earthquake, uh, there's some major displacement and that rock will begin to settle into those newfound spaces, which can result in uh, aftershock earthquakes. So 
and the fault has already occurred, but this is an effect of all of that rock body settling. And these will be uh, smaller in magnitude than the actual main event earthquake, uh, but greater generally in magnitude than the four shock earthquakes. We are able to keep track of all this information using seismology. That being specifically the study of earthquakes. Mainly in this, we use seismographs, which are the instruments that detect and record earthquakes. This is a very sensitive instrument that can pick up on minute uh, changes in vibration in the ground. So uh, there is a needle along this. Well, this is the older version. Now they're digital, and you can see nearly live updates of seismographs uh, by the USGS anywhere. But uh, the original principle was that we had this piece of paper on a rotating drum and uh, the instrument with a fixed needle along this paper, and as it picked up on those vibrations, it would move the needle in um, ratio to that same vibration, and the larger the spike recorded on that paper, the larger the vibration. During an earthquake, you would then see huge back and forth uh, crests and peaks in these waves recorded on the paper. The closer it is to a flat line, the least earthquake activity is happening. There are many seismographs all over the world uh, by countries with their own versions of the USGS and their own acronyms. All of these work together and share their information in the Federation of Digital Broadcasting Seismic Networks in order to communicate uh, any possible risk to one another. There are two categories of seismic waves. One is body waves and the other is surface waves. Surface waves are what we actually feel earthquakes as and see the damage of. Whether it's body waves are the ones that are absorbed and move through Earth's interior. These are the ones that we focused on during our Earth's interior lecture when we were talking about P waves and S waves and how they move through the Earth's interior and that's how we really have a good idea of what uh, everything below the surface may look like. So recall from that that P waves or primary waves are the ones that move through both liquids and solids and S waves our secondary waves move through solids only. But both P waves and S waves are both types of body seismic waves. And they do move slightly different from one another. P waves move compressionally through a medium, whereas S waves move in an oscillating fashion. Because of the way that these waves move or propagate, uh, P waves actually travel about 60% faster than S waves. Think about it this way. If we're looking at how P waves move, it is a direct motion from point A to point B straight across. Compare that to S waves, and really we're going A, B, C, D, E, F. There's a lot of movement in between that, so it's actually covering more distance within the, the overall uh, displacement. So P waves will arrive at, from one monitoring, from what, well, where it occurs, the earthquake occurs, the P waves will arrive at the monitoring station before the S waves do. And that difference in time, knowing that uh, the average speed of P waves is about 6 kilometers per second, and the average speed of S waves is about 3.6 kilometers per second. We can back calculate uh, what distance we are from at the monitoring station, what distance we are from where that earthquake occurred, allowing us to find the epicenter of an earthquake. The difference in arrival time between those P and S waves is called the SP interval. When looking at a seismograph, the first and most notice noticeable thing that jumps out at you is the arrival of the surface waves. Again, those are the ones that we can really feel on the surface and cause the damage. So that's what we see is this huge grouping of spikes on the seismograph. Now the S and P waves are pictured here, so we can see the arrival of the well, my laptop just died, um, but I'm going to leave this abrupt breakage here and hope that it helps uh, reel your attention back in. So uh, here we are looking at the seismograph. 
And if you'll notice, the, the time zero is actually over here on the left. Normally when we're looking at graphs, we're reading it in time from left to right with increase in time in this direction. It's actually the opposite in this case. So uh, the way the seismograph works is that it has to write what is occurring. Um, so what occurred first is the arrival of the surface waves, this big boom here. And mind you, the S wave is then occurring before the P wave, hence the SP interval. So this is not mislabeled, it's just that the, the time scale is somewhat reversed here. And in this particular example here, the, the difference in time between the arrival of the S and P waves was approximately 500 seconds. Um, so this was not terribly far away from the monitoring station. The, the greater the amount of time between the P and S arrival, so the greater the SP interval, the greater the distance away the monitoring station is from where that earthquake is occurring, or the epicenter. And that calculation of distance really isn't as difficult as you might assume. Um, with the help of this nifty time travel graph, so on here we have time on the y-axis and distance in kilometers on the uh, x-axis, and then we have the speed of S waves, you know, so their slope uh, is the speed, so because that's a distance over time, and then P waves and then S minus P, the difference between those two speeds, um, which is really what we're considering when we're talking about the SP interval. So uh, say for example, the difference between the arrival of S&P waves or SP interval for some earthquake was 50 seconds. We just simply go to the time in seconds over here to 50, move across uh, our x-axis until it hits that SP line, come down here, and that tells us it's just shy of about 500 kilometers away from us. Now mind you, all that really tells you is the distance from where we're at to the earthquake, us where we're being at being the monitoring station. Uh, that's just the distance that doesn't tell us direction. That's like your Google Maps telling you in, in 500 feet, turn. Well, turn, turn where? Turn left, right? What would you enter the roundabout? What do you want me to do? So the way that we configure what where that epicenter is, is we will triangulate it, meaning that we will <clears throat> draw uh, using that radial distance, that distance calculated from that graph, three circles, try, triangulate, and where those overlap indicates where our epicenter is. So let's get into it with an example. Um, let's say that we just did our calculation and based on the number of seconds, uh, we got 624 kilometers for our radial distance to uh, the epicenter of the earthquake, and we're here at the monitoring station in Vegas. So we would take our compass, that little doodad that you get in your math classes that has the pencil on one end and the spiky point on the other, and we draw a circle representing on our map 624 kilometers with the pointy spiked end right in the center, Vegas dot, where our monitoring station is, and move all the way around and make our circle. So that knows that it can be anywhere along that line. Uh, distance from our station, and then we get the data from uh, two other stations. In this case, it's the station in Eureka, uh, Eureka, excuse me, and Elko. Or no, that's not. Yes, it is. I need to find my glasses. So, anyways, we get the data from these. We do the same thing with drawing the circles, and you can see where they all intersect and overlap. Boom! Right there is our epicenter. There you have it. Really, any one of you could calculate the epicenter of an earthquake given the right data set. A couple more vocabulary terms for you guys. We grade earthquakes on intensity and magnitude, probably both terms you've heard before, again, in the news associated with earthquakes. Intensity is actually the observed effects of the earthquake, so this is essentially asking what's the damage done. We use the modified Mercalli scale for this. This is a scale from 1 to 12, 1 being the least destructive and 12 being the most destructive, completely catastrophic. This really isn't anything mathematical, this is just uh, what meets a specific criteria of observations. This is the actual modified Mercalli scale of intensity. Some of you may remember uh, feeling the earthquake that we had out of Galesburg here in Michigan. 
uh, around 2015. It could be felt from quite a distance. I was outside of Grand Rapids at the time and I was sitting on top of the deck. I thought that a deer had run into um, the, the bottom portion of the deck and just rattled a little bit because it had happened quite a few times before. Found out a few days later, uh, not even a few hours later, but a few days later, that it was actually an earthquake. So uh, think back to where you were, if you felt it, uh, if you remember it, and take a look at this Mercalli scale and see where you would actually place it. One being not felt except by very few under especially favorable conditions, and 12 being damage total, lines of sight and level are distorted, objects thrown into the air. I think personally I would put it around a 2-3 there. Um, I don't know if the standing motor cars rocked slightly, but uh, some people didn't recognize it as an earthquake, but it would, from what I talked to uh, other people about, it sounds like most people felt it noticeably, like they were alerted to it. Um, as was I, I just thought that I didn't think it was an earthquake, but I want to hear from you guys uh, next class that were in person during lab. What did you think it was on the Mercalli scale? Magnitude is uh, the other part of this. This one is actually quite mathematical, and the magnitude is the earthquake energy level, or the, the amount of energy released due to an earthquake. Uh, we use the Richter scale for this. The Richter scale is not actually used to convey any particular type of damage, um, although you may have heard it associated with different levels of damage. This is because the level of damage is also in part dependent on the structures or building integrity and a number of these other factors. And that's really why we have the two different systems entirely. If we released the same magnitude earthquake here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, as we did over in West California, we would see uh, you know, equal magnitudes, but a much greater intensity uh, here in Michigan than out west in California, and that's because we're not prepared for something like that. We don't build for something like that because it's not something that we experience. A lot of times people will say that the Richter scale is from 0 to 10. Uh, there's technically no upper limit on that. I, the largest earthquake ever recorded was uh, around a 9.5. Let me double check that. It was indeed 9.5. That was the Valdivia earthquake. So your, your teachers stop what they're doing to Google the correct answer to. To give you some reference, that 9-ish magnitude uh, is about equal to detonating a billion tons of TNT. That is extremely catastrophic. Um, whether as something less than a 2 or around a 2 is something that we're probably not going to feel at all. Now we calculate that release of energy by looking at the amplitude of the waves on the seismograph, or really the, um, the height of these up-downs on that graph, to put it in simple terms. And when we're looking at the amplitude, really we're talking about the distance from our base axes to the, the maximum height that it did reach. So it's not really from the top to the bottom, but rather the middle to the top or the middle to the bottom. It should be the same distance. We can then take that distance, that measured distance in millimeters and um, use a given ratio to correspond that uh, onto the Richter scale. Mind you, this is logarithmic, so that means that there's a uh, x-fold increase with each increase in magnitude. Um, meaning that each increase is a multiple of the previous. For instance, if um, we have, we're comparing a 6.0 magnitude to a 7.0 magnitude on the Richter scale, the each unit increase specifically on the Richter scale is a 32-fold increase in release energy, meaning that a 7.0 magnitude earthquake is 32 times greater than a 6.0 earthquake uh, in the amount of energy that is released with that event. Really there's a couple more steps in that process, but it's just a bit more math. So that's all I have for you guys for part one. Um, I will see you in part two. We'll talk about 
of the hazards associated with earthquakes and how we can prepare for them and uh, other after effects such as tsunamis and whatnot.